Unser nächster Vortrag ist auf Englisch. Ich bin mir jetzt nicht sicher, ob ich das auch in Englisch anmoderieren soll. Ich mache es einfach. Uh, our next talk uh, is done by Peter Kieseberg. He is also from SBA Research. Uh, he has his master's degree from the uh, Vienna Technical University in technical mathematics, specializations in cryptography and numerical mathematics. That's a really a nice topic. <laughs> and he is now also working at SP Research. Before, he was uh, also a consultant and he was working in the telecommunications sector. And his talk today will be about directions in database forensic. So welcome, Peter. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, here's the presenter. So I'm the last talk before the final, so I'll keep it a bit faster. Thank you very much for still attending. I will hold a Taught my talk about some recent research directions, results, and work in progress in the area of database forensics. And the big question is why, actually. I mean, nice, but why? Uh, this comes from my former life before I joined research. I was a consultant and mainly in the area of data warehousing, enrichment of data, aggregation of data, medi data mediation. And there it was really interesting to see how much is done actually in the databases, how prevalent the database is in the architect architecture, and actually what you could do when you had access to this kind of system of this application. So especially if you're doing, uh, doing business intelligence and this, this kind of stuff. So one of the background is some years ago we had a look at the landscape in IT forensics and realized that there's a lot of work done and it's really good work done in file forensics. Actually web 2 forensics, cloud forensics was starting and got better and better, more and more publications. But still in the area of database forensics, two years ago, a colleague from, from South Amer America did a review, finding about, I think, some dozen papers per year, which is compared to other areas in, uh, of forensics, really pretty, 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 pretty low number. So it's still a bit neglected, and that's why we, we started to focus on this area of research. For me, personally, it's interesting because there's a lot of uh, data actually stored in databases, of course, and especially in business environments, if you talk to about, not, not really talk about hardcore security features, where say of the network or of the layer or such, uh, network layer or such things, but if you more talk about uh, data needed for, 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 for strategic purposes of a company, you see that data often in business environments and BI environments resulting in a database environment. And now, uh, during the last years, with big data, this got even more prominent when looking into especially medical research. We have some projects there with, with uh, different universities who are really do, really doing data mining on actually medical data, for example, in the genome area for uh, finding better cancer treatments. Okay, what's the main problem we see? You have these nice graphics and this nice feature. Usually a, da da a database, but what, what's a database actually? I mean, okay, we all know it's a bunch of data usually, more or less. But, and that's often neglected if you're looking at security architectures or forensics architectures, it's not just a monolithic data storage. There's a lot of things done in databases, for example, business logics. If you look at, let's say, data warehouses in real applications, you often see a lot of the business logic stored inside the database as a stored procedure, as a whatever, aggregation rules and so on. What you all see is, okay, structures, you not only have the data, you also have the link between the data, of course, between the tables, between fields and so on. Next thing is, what's often neglected is our internal mechanisms. Databases are actually designed in order to be rather resilient with a safety back, um, uh, mindset in the background. You want your data to be correct. If something crashes, you have to roll back, you have to do crash recovery, you have to have provide atomic actions, you have to do all kinds of stuff, and you have to do it really pretty fast. And that's where we come in the optimization parts. So if you have a real uh, industry-grade database, you need performance, which is again, often, let's say, a counterpart to security. Now, there are Tons of database models, and this, I don't want to, to invent a new one, but what is often neglected, you usually look, look at it from a data perspective. And I mean a usage data perspective. And one thing is neglected here 
is actually the structure of the database itself. Of course, you have the query interface. Everybody knows that. that's what you type in the SQL. And even this can be really interesting for forensics purposes, for example, for looking at metadata on the database level and so on. Still, often done, not that powerful. You have a lot of backend methods. That's where actually the database administrators, for example, working. You look at, you have the audit and control, you have all these kinds of database logs that an administrator is actually having for, for finding issues, for rectifi rectification, and so on. But you have also far deeper database internals, and that's actually how the database structures itself. For example, the tree, the index trees, how they are constructed, how data is stored on the logical side, which is really interesting. Or you even go, can go down even deeper, down to the file system size, and look at, for example, actually what's constituting the database, the definition files, the actual data that's physically stored in pages on the disk, and all this kind of stuff. Transaction mechanisms that are really stored on the, di on the disk. Now what the approaches I want to talk, for the, the top two are, let's say there's a lot of literature on that, and there's a lot of best practices, there are a lot of products you can use for providing all and control in high efficient databases and so on. Uh, the research directions I want to show a bit here are targeting the lower two levels, the database internals and the file system really below. Okay. Um, I was told that at every conference there has to be a Venn diagram abused. So here you have it. Still, I want to sell, tell you something with this diagram. Um, the core target of forensics actually is to define what was changed, for example, our targets. What was changed, who did it, and actually often when. And here I want to really, really focus a bit on our attack vector. We are not, we, I am personally more interested in a in insider attacks, especially from powerful users, say database administrator usually. Why? Because that's actually the most challenging and interesting version. All others you can, for external users, you can do a lot on the upper two layers. But for a database administrator who's actually able, who's actually owning the log files and your all in control mechanisms, it's very much, it's pretty much harder, and you can do a more interesting theoretical stuff here. And this brings us to the first approach I want to present here, and that's the transaction, using the transaction, the transaction system, sorry. What's the transaction systems? Well, in typical database environments, you want to have transaction security. Well, in case you fail, your database crashes, you want to bring it to a defined, safe state where you know what you have done, and where you can guarantee that all the data, all the operations up to a certain point have been really done, executed, and the data is valid. And also, the this internal structures of the database are correct with respect to uh, the data stored inside. And um, also what you want to do is provide rollbacks. Everybody knows rollbacks, but that's more a side note. Side note. So this is an internal mechanism that's actually really deep inside in database. And I want, we've now focused on one product here, it was MySQL. Why? Uh, that's pretty simple, because there is at least some sort of documentation there, and you're able to look at the source code. And you're not, uh, they don't try to prosecute you if you do reverse engineering, like there is done from several others, or at least one other. What is the transaction mechanism, or how is the transaction mechanism uh, structured in, in, in MySQL? And it, actually, that's InnoDB. The storage engine we use in InnoDB is now the standard engine. Uh, actually, it's file-based. You have two of these files. Here you see the structure of the files. You have, of course, some head, heading information, padding, forget that. You have two checkpoints. I'm just uh, showing, uh, they are not really interesting from a forensics perspective. These two are here for actually doing some kind of transaction mechanism on the transaction mechanism, providing uh, some, some tools for detecting manipulations of the log file itself, actually done with a safety perspective in the background. And then you have a lot of blocks, and the blocks are so simply write-throughs of the database mechanism, or of the database, 
when writing to the data files or data uh, making of, to the database files themselves itself. It's also doing a double write through to the log files for certain log entries. So you have the structured in log blocks and log blocks again, and again structured in 512 bytes. That's interesting for the internals. There's a, some nice mechanisms for, for how to handle large blocks and so on. Still, that's, that's, that's not part of this talk here. What's interesting is, and why this is such a good source of information is, first, this is um, cyclic. It's, it's used in a cyclic way. So they don't delete, after a commit for a statement, for example, they don't delete old log blocks because it's not very performant. They just add and add and add. And if the file is reaching the size, the delimited size, they're doing some kind of cyclic, using it as a cyclic storage. So they start again at the start. And that's actually, you find a lot of old information. If you do, if you do a lot of commits and if you have some larger transaction mechanism files or reserve some space for, space for this, you find a lot of information still from older dates dating back for, for, to a former time. Um, also, this is not protected. It's not encrypted, actually. Why? First, you would need to uh, store the key somewhere. That's an internal mechanism. And the second thing is you want performance. So what can we look, what, what can we see if we look at transaction log? Let's say all information that's, that you need to revert has at least one entry. So you, they don't store selects or such things, but what they do is everything that changes something on the database, at least one entry, per change usually typically between eight and 12. So even if this is called an internal documentation to be a log, it's, it's not readable like a log. Um, some minor details, update statements are simply written as insert and deletes with a linking between them. You have, of course, timestamps. You have some kind of metadata on users on, on, on such things. And if information is overwritten, of course you can Gain, get out this overwritten information. Interesting, all delete statements are simply mark as delete. We'll come to that ba uh, back later in another technique using the index. There's no real delete. Why? Because it's costly. There are about 30 types of different inf log information, so we can do all kinds of stuff. When we do querying, but, but what's an interesting thing is we can use this for query reconstruction, for example, and for con constructing older stage, states of the database. What we do here in order to, to, to really reconstruct an old query is that we actually look for specific log entries that work like some kind of bracket around the different log entries that are, you, that are inserted by an uh, update or an insert or a delete command. These are then grouped together, who are belong together, also along the timeline. And then we determine, then we determine the type. Is this an insert? Is this a delete? Is this an update? And so on. Based on this, we can start a reconstruction, of course, and link different, uh, for example, generate a timeline with all the changes back and revert back to an older stage, for example. Actually, we can even get a bit more information. We can get real timeline with who did what and um, we can get even older information if, if it was all written, for example. So this is just a picture of, of, of how such a block, for example, looks like. It's not really readable. It's more binary uh, block with, of variable length. That's for an insert statement. That's actually the relevant part of an insert statement. There are about 10 uh, more, uh, 10 more, more blocks, but still this is the... This is the interesting part where we actually have meta information about the table space ID, actually even on what page it was physically stored. Um, of course, then information on the insert itself, number of fields, how much unique identifiers, how much on all this kind of stuff, length of uh, length definitions for the columns, some kind of offsets, and then last but not least, the actually inserted data. Small example, how this can be looked at. Uh, for this example, we had a demo for this with an actual tool. Uh, the problem is it took a bit long for really demonstrating, about 10 to 15 minutes, and actually gave you a shell where you 
saw that, yeah, well, two lines were the same, which was, yeah, well, not really a proof that we actually did what we did. Uh, so we, uh, we skipped that part and uh, went back to shiny, shiny font with uh, different colors. That's about abusing the color spectrum of LaTeX. Um, we use a very simple table, that's the table fruits. And since I'm a mathematician, I'm not really a fan of giving uh, variables nice names. I just call them one, two, and three. I'm really sorry. So we have a primary key and we have two, uh, three fields actually. This is what we know. I'll come to that uh, back a bit later. And this is now actually a nicer version of an insert block now filled with the data. And I don't want to go through through now. I don't want to go through through every every byte here. Just uh, bringing out some really some of the more interesting. The first two bits are actually uh, the first is actually um, first byte is actually showing um, the 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 or giving the type. Here you find, for example, the number of columns, which is six. This is where this is something you have to know, which is not in the documentation. Actually, it's always two more than the actual number of uh, rows of uh, columns. Why? Um, because there are also two internal columns for meta information for the da da database, also stored inside your table. And if we look at it, actually, real here we have some. Here we have the length definitions of the fields. First, second, third. Fourth, uh, if it's if there's 800, uh, 8,000 put there, it just means uh, it's a variable, a field of variable length. You can look at this in the papers we have on on this, how this actually defined was law of reversing of of Vino de B, and the real data is actually residing actually in these these four fields, and if you translate this back the last three fields to SC, you can then generate actually the table, uh, the, 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 the insert statements that was um, done. I talked about the table structure. So of course, if you're an insider, we actually assume that you actually know something about the tables you're uh, trying to manipulate. I think that's, I think it was reasonable. But still, you can, if you don't do, you can still find out a lot of things from the meta table, metadata from the files of in the bay. Actually, for every table, you have a table name .ifrm file, and uh, there you have actually this is actually a structure. Oops, wrong. This is actually a structure of this table of the of these files. So you have some file headers and so on. You have the definition of the keys, and then you have simply have the column definitions right written inside. That's really nice, actually. It's really convenient. So now we're talking about practicability. Print, in principle, what we're dealing with is an internal mechanism. So downsides and actually are that there is poor documentation on that part, because it's actually not really meant to be used by anybody else. But OK, one person has to find out, and everybody can use it. But more problematic is uh, changes. Uh, since this is an internal mechanism, this can be changed arbitrarily by uh, even in minor steps uh, up upgrades. So you have to somehow keep your knowledge stable. But still, this can also be done. The third one is um, maybe something where say, okay, that that could be a real drawback to say availability, especially regarding overwriting. Um, here, if you define your transaction mechanisms to be too small. You only got a really, really, really small window of your history. You always only have a window in your history, of course, because it, due to the cyclic nature of the of the transaction mechanism, you override all data or unneeded data at some point in time. Typically, we had some, we ha we did some, actually did some experiments setting up a, da a, a database with some, I don't know, 100, 150 million records, and doing. Um, Love specifying a, a bit larger uh, transaction mechanisms and doing inserts, delete, updates. Actually, it was practicable for some, let's say, to go back someday. We simulated some kind of uh, aggregation workflows 
and you could go back then in our in our our some days in just using the transaction log. What's nice about the transaction log is that's re really really complete, and that actually also the database administrator, or let's say the database itself, from the administrator point of perspective, you don't have a right access to this kind of things. Actually, you could use file carving techniques for manipulating really the file itself, like we read from the file. I wouldn't really recommend doing this for two reasons. First, you have the checks points. We are again uh, looking that no, there, there are no changes directly in the files, inserted in the files, so you have to do this very, very fast and very, very reliable. And the other problem is that even small inconsistencies in these internal mechanisms could lead lead to a complete database crash. You're just simply destroying the, in, the, the, the actual, the, the actual um, reliability of the database. And there are a lot of mechanisms actually looking after these files if there are changes from the outside world. Still, what you could do, and it was another pr approach that, that, that uh, we had during the last, uh, during the last years, was if you really wanted to make it 100, let's see, 100% yeah, proof against manipulations from database administrator, it's very, very simple to add a chaining mechanism. Why is it simple? Because you don't have to change much. Due to this very flexible internal definition of how these files are constructed, it's very easy to make space for small, for, 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 for adding chaining between different log files. So you could make, uh, you could chain entries together so you can't simply delete, insert, or modify them in between. This is typically done by using a standard hash chaining like it was uh, proposed by Schneier in the 90s. So you start with a seed uh, and have a random number generator running in the background where you only where have a secret seed and uh, you're generating some kind of witness for each record. So if you if I want if I insert a new 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 log entry, I add a hash of the old, the, pre, the exact previous entry, and everything depending from a secret random seed uh, from, a, from a random number. This, of course, doesn't work if, you, if the attack has got root privileges in addition to database administrator privileges. I'd consider this a minor. If you've got root privileges, you can do so many other things. I don't think you will run, a re you will uh, really look at the chaining mechanisms. Okay, we talked a lot about the index. And that's where it's getting really interesting also. Too, also. Um, what's, the, what's the index actually? What's the main target of the index? You want to structure your data on the physical storage usually, as a, depending on the index. You want to speed up your operations. Select is often critical. So the speed of your select statement is often critical in, 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 in databases. And it allows simple allocation of your resources. There are actually two types of um, main types of indexes in the Bay. That's the primary index, which is really used for data structuring, and secondary indexes, which are actually used for, for a pre-computing or like optimizing, not pre-computing, but optimizing uh, select statements, usually together with, it's done with views. If you, actually, if you do a few, at least in Oracle, you always have some kind of internal index in the background. So, What's, an, what, what's this kind of index? What is this structure from a structure point of view? I'm now talking about a primary index. It's actually a tree structure for our data, how we actually store the data on the actual disk. We have pages where the actual data is residing and the data is stored, I'll come to this back later, uh, in a linked list. And you have a tree-like structure, a B plus tree, uh, actually, uh, it's not a real B plus tree, but a modification of a B plus tree uh, that's actually um, helping in speeding up the search. So here you all you start with an infimonome, you have a point to supremum, and then you have um, internal nodes that give you information on the underlying pages. These are real physical pages, actually. If you're looking at the index page, what you have in the index page. Um, Different from other database systems, actually the primary index in MySQL and InnoDB is actually really, really very, very closely linked to actually where the data is stored on the physical file. So you really have 
the metadata for the index, then you have the user re records, and then you have the page directory all together at one page. Um, if I'm looking now at one of these pages, actually, it's a bit more complicated. We have an infimum, we have a supremum, then we have the data, the, 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 the data stored in a linked list, and we have a kind of page directory, which is some kind of shortcut in order to even speed up uh, processing a bit more. And this gives us some nice, nice uh, ideas for, uh, for, 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 for forensic purposes. Because what I talked before is that when InnoDB is deleting a record, it's not really deleting it, it's marking it for delete. And how is this done? It's actually quite simple. At first, it searches, of course, for the page where the data record is stored. OK, traversing, traversing through the B tree. That's nice. What it then does is allocate the exact data, set, data record inside the record page. So far, it's nice. What it then does is actually, let's say this is the step from deleting this record number five. We, we go to this record number five. What it then does is actually removing the links in the linked list going to and from this record. So the, just the pointers are changed. So the pointer of the one before is, for example, uh, linking to the record bit afterwards, and this, rec this link is, or is linking to itself. But what it does, here you have already have a deleted record. record. The, all the deleted records are actually stored in some additional list inside the same page. You have a garbage offset where you start, and you can traverse to the next or first deleted record. So in case a new record is deleted, it's just added to this list. So what you can do is, if you look really on the, rec on, on the index, if you, if you, if you look on the, on, if, you, if you delete a record, it's not actually deleted from the file systems, but it's unlinked from the primary index. So if I'm, for example, capable, and that's quite simple, of, hmm, wrong button, of accessing the garbage offset, which is on a specified position, I can actually traverse through the list of deleted records. Of course, only until the space is reused again. The interesting part is, or one of the interesting parts is, that actually, if, especially if you're talking about smaller records, not really vlogs or vlogs blobs or such things, those deleted records often stay very, very persistent in the system. Why? Because it's really, really, it's actually often more efficient to add new data on a uh, add new data on a large empty space than to actually search for a suitable slot somewhere in another page and put my record inside there here. So actually this can stay, we found, and we, we simulated some, 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 some database with uh, daily updates and so on. You can months and weeks and months afterwards, after the delete, you can still find the deleted, often you can still find a lot of the deleted records. And not only you find the deleted records, you can also find the timeline of the deletion. So this is very interesting actually for finding manipul for finding, for example, delete, deleted records in a forensic investigation. We're talking also about something else, and that's, that's if we, I, I say that I did a lot of things in the area of the, uh, data warehousing and business intelligence. And what's a really, really often overlooked thing is that people don't look at the database. Of course, you have the database, you, it gets data, it does a lot of processing, and the things are stored, and that's all very nice. But the people are looking through it uh, using business BI tools usually, like Cognos, S-Base, Hyperion, I guess you all know them. Or at least do some kind of, of, of evaluation and deliver the, actually de deliver aggregated data, not the raw data. So the question is, why not misuse that? And here a nice uh, strategy is using the secondary index. Secondary index is much simpler than primary index. It's actually just a structured list, typically also a B tree, um, that's giving a good traversing through actually a primary index, the, 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 the data stored in the primary index. That's all. What you could do 
or what's often done if you're, doing, if you're talking about large real-life databases, is that if you've got a job, a select that you do frequently, you do a secondary index. You generate a secondary index in order to speed up, drastically speed up your performance. For example, you've got a coconut cube, cube in, uh, in the back on top of it. You have for every data load you have your fuse, and the fuse are generating a, an index. So what's a nice thing if we want to do betrayal on the business intelligence level, it's actually just remove, don't remove the data from the real primary index. Leave it there. All the audit and control mechanisms will see it, will be happy. You don't have any manipulations on, on the file level. You don't have manipulations in the transaction log. Just remove it simply from the secondary index. And that's working until somebody does an index reorg, for example. But you could automate this, this for example. Especially if you're doing, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're generating your meta to viewable metadata just at, at well predefined uh, points in time. And that's very nice. So, in case you want to check, or if we want to look at the database from a forensic perspective, we not only have to check the data that's actually stored, we don't have to look at the data that's somewhere in an index, we also have to look at the structural components in order to detect certain kinds of manipulations. Actually, this is also quite fun, uh, playing around with the whole index, it's all with the primary index, this is also a great way of doing stereographical hiding of data. Uh, databases are perfect for this. They are large, they are often changed, and you can hide large amounts of data inside them. Okay, the last approach I want to present, which is, let's say, the most theoretical, is again, we already had to be plus three, got something to do with trees. Again, with B plus trees, I hear I need a bit more, more explanation. It's actually a straight, straight, it's actually a tree, a tree, a balanced tree. It possesses between B half and B elements per node, except the root node, which means you have a tree that's actually, um, well, here's, let's say, a picture set told, tells you more than, than actually uh, uh, the definition. You have a balanced tree, so all the, all the elements are on the same level, all the leaf nodes are on the same level. You have data in, for B plus the data only really residing in the leaf nodes, and you have a certain structure of this tree. And the principal question was now, if I insert data to a database, okay, the same set of data, do I get the same tree? I mean, of course, it's same with the same tree with respect of the data that's stored inside, so it's the same. But is it different in structure? And if it's different, on what does it depend whether it's different? If it's on, the, on, on for example, the order of inserts or, or changes, or if I use like, deletes or, or, or inserts and all this kind of stuff. And if I can find this, if there are differences, can I somehow determine, determine techniques for, uh, for, 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 for detecting manipulations in a, during a forensic investigation? The sad thing is that there's no, we actually proved this some, 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 some months ago, um, there's no real general solution for that. You can actually prove that uh, even doing simple inserts, you can generate um, one ex uh, all except one valid structures of a B tree. That's the downside. But what you can do is you can do it for, um, let's say, specific subclasses. In case we have an index that's, or let's say a table that's generated on an index that's insert only, and the, and the data is strictly monotone ascending, then we can find this, then we can actually find a technique based on that. Um, that's actually, that sounds a bit, okay, artificial. Actually, it's not so artificial because if you're looking at all con in control tables, all the in auto indexing and so on, you actually ha always have this prerequisite. You have strict monotonous in indexes, you have uh, insert only, and actually in case of inner debates, even, even that way, uh, that internally the primary index is always strictly monotonous. If you define another primary index for a table, it's simply generating a shadow index that's actually uh, monotonous. So that's actually not even so, 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 so artificial. Um, actually, you can also have the dual case, of course. 
what's the idea, what kind of things we want to detect here? It's actually a bit, uh, let's say, a more specific task. Again, in the area of data warehousing, what's often happening is that aggregation workflows are actually done on a very specific time. Often this is really timed. For example, you have your bill run on the third, so in the night of the w first, you, you have your run over the data of the last month, and then you're writing that. So you don't actually want to really manipulate your, so your, ba your fundamental data. Just want to, for example, remove it right before an action and then insert it back. That will be pretty convenient. Everybody who's looking at the data with all these kind of all in control workflows is always having a perfect, perfectly valid and sound database. But just at the point in time where you actually do the calculation, you remove it. Actually, funny story. Uh, we we had, this is we didn't invent this. Actually, we saw this some years ago. I was still in my old job. We had this uh, problem of a consultant who, let's say, he wanted to save on 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 on, on bills he was generating and was in uh, uh, in the in the, in the, in, the, in in the telecommunications industry, and before the bill run, he was working on a live database, and before the bill run, he tried to really actually remove his data, let the bill run run, and uh, insert it back. Actually, it didn't really succeed because uh, different story, but this is actually something that's really, it's really capable of doing, and which could be really, really useful. Okay, that's the only slide of math. What I want to, what I want to actually say with this um, slide is, we can find, if we've got an ascending order and a strictly monotonous ascending order, we can find trees of a certain structure. And what we can now say is that if we, in, in the, just in its case, before mentioned case, if the structure of our trees is, differ, is, differing, is different from that what we actually anticipate, we can detect forged records so, or some, some uh, forging scenarios. I want to hold back. There's also some limitations. What I want to say with the slide is if you insert enormous amounts of records, you can actually generate, regenerate the structure of uh, a valid structure. The problem is for a normal database or for a normal application, you will need to enter some million of artificial data and if you don't detect this, you have a problem anyway, I'd say. So, in conclusion, what I want to present you are some, some, let's say, more theoretical uh, research approaches towards database forensics. I didn't focus on, on, on uh, typical applications here or application side techniques here that's actually pretty well known and where you can buy products, but let's say a more novel approaches especially focusing on database administrator, of course. And I didn't do this alone. There's many people who helped uh, developing several of the, of the techniques. Uh, I did, the, the people who were, who were really had this, this group done uh, talking thing, this, this air was Sebastian Schrittweiser here from Target and Peter Fruitt, who is now with Atomic. And in case of questions, I will be around. I don't know, I think it's still five minutes, then the next talk is starting, so I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, I will be around for the remain, for remaining evening. So thank you very much. <laughs>